start by having a show of hands. Um, who's involved in shared care glaucoma at the moment? Is anybody here involved in shared care glaucoma? Nope. Does anybody intend to get involved in shared care glaucoma? Okay, one person, two people. Does anybody intend to do any of the certification? Okay, a couple of people. Does anybody check intraocular pressures? Does anybody refer a patient to a glaucoma clinic? Then we're all involved in shared care glaucoma, believe it or not. We are, because where do the patients come from? They come from the person who gets first contact with the patient. So the, I, I, don't, I hardly pick patients up from the wards referred by my physician colleagues. And GPs don't check intraocular pressure. So you're all involved in shared care glaucoma. The only thing that's constant in life, they say, is tax and death. Well, change is the third one as far as I'm concerned. Things are constantly changing. Just when you think you've got it right, it changes again. Thankfully, we're all living longer, but with that comes the expectation to live healthier. Technology is making us live healthier, and therefore we wouldn't take anything less than perfect. Our patients are getting a lot more demanding, so we need to give them what they ask of us. The professional landscape is changing, you know? If I was going to get panicked by the change that's happening in glaucoma care, I'll think I'll be out of work. If you were going to get panicked by the change that's happening with spinal laser refractive surgery or myopia control or presbyopia control, you will panic yourself out of work. But as a colleague of mine pointed out, before cataract surgery, a lot of optometry chair time was in tweaking glasses for people with 618 vision every year. Now they've all had their cataracts done, but you're not out of business. There's going to be a lot of change as glaucoma care improves, and it's got to happen. And we've got to think then that are we going to be part of the wave of the improvement in glaucoma care because we can't hold it back. So my role as an ophthalmologist is changing because before you never used to do Goldman tonometry. Now Goldman tonometry is going out into the community and I'm glad about that. I'm glad about that because it frees me up to do surgery, which is what I'm good at. Um, so your role as optometrist in glaucoma care is changing. You know, you never used to take intraocular pressures at all before, not too long ago when you had to do a shiok tonometry in the hospital, which was a major event. So most people turned up with their vision half gone anyway. And now, not only are you doing it, healthcare assistants are now doing eye care as the patient comes in even before I see that. Of optists are now a lot more involved in the eye clinic. Optometrists and optists are injecting in macular clinics. And then, on top of that, we've got better connected diagnostic equipment and we've got artificial intelligence, and I've put that in red. And what, why that's really important is that it's shifting sands. As we all catch up with the next wave of glaucoma care, we're going to get moved on again because it's going to change. And it's therefore important that whatever we plan has to consider that change. And of course there's politics, there's Brexit and no Brexit, and there's funding and no funding. But there are a few things that we know already. One of the things we know is the definition of glaucoma. We now have this notion of shared care. We didn't know that we were involved in shared care, but I think we'll all agree now that we all are involved in shared care. Um, we know the various diagnostic te tests we, we normally need to do and our treatment modalities. And we also know that there are successful screening schemes. And then you ask yourself, but why isn't anybody talking about uh, glaucoma screening at the National Screening Committee level? Does anybody know why? Why, why is glaucoma screening not happening like diabetic retinopathy screening in a very organized way? Okay, we'll talk about that. We know the definition of glaucoma. We know that glaucoma is a progressive 
chain, which is as a result of damage to the optic nerve for various reasons we don't fully understand yet. And this results in visual field loss and unfortunately leads to blindness if untreated. But we also know that some of our well-treated patients go blind. So there must be a few risk factors in blindness from glaucoma that we don't know. We know about case finding. As there's no screening program, case finding is opportunistic and that starts with you. So without you, 90% of the glaucomas are not going to get picked up. But we also know that those patients who are at high risk of glaucoma, unfortunately, tend to live in deprived communities where their high streets don't have as many optometry shops as the high streets that have a waitress shop in it. And there's also the issue of remuneration. You know, glaucoma has just come along. It takes a lot more time than what it will take you to do an eye test. And you don't get paid 300 pounds for spending an hour doing the fields and repeat fields. Some people get paid if they're in a scheme. The rest of us, what's happening? So something needs to happen about that. What, I mean, if you're not involved in glaucoma skin, I'm sure some people here would have spent half an hour, 45 minutes, with the odd patients they're concerned about, with pressures. And, and that, that is a lot of chair time, and we all have to pay our mortgages and put food on the table. Now, we know, I'm going through the things, I hope you all agree with me, we all know this. We all know which people are at risk of sight loss from glaucoma. And knowing the people at risk, obviously, means we are divert our attention very quickly to ensuring that we give them the necessary attention, knowing fully well that you are the only ones who are going to be picking these people up. If you don't pick them up during your sight test examination, the only time they present themselves is when they're walking into the lamppost, which is, we all agree, is too late. So by knowing the risk factors, increasing age, family history of glaucoma, we have to find a way of making sure we take that, that history, myopia, diabetics, as well as um, people of African origin. So increasing age. Only 2% at 40, up to 10% in over 75. Would you believe that? 10% of over 75, so 1 in 10 people over 75 has glaucoma. But we don't always pick it up, but thankfully most of them go to their grave with useful vision, never knowing they had glaucoma. But they do have glaucoma. Now, if they then start living to 100, it becomes a problem. Right? And then twice as many again have ocular hypertension and, and know that as many people as we know and have picked up with the diagnosis of glaucoma are living out in the community not knowing they have glaucoma. And those unfortunately are the people who walk into the clinic because they've walked into a lamppost effectively. But luckily many of them never get advanced disease. So we're not doing what the diabetic retinopathy screening is doing of aiming to get 95 to 98%. We're only hitting 50%. And if we're going to be living longer, we need to do something. Because at the moment, even though 10% have glaucoma at 70, they tend to die off very quickly within 5 to 8 years. We don't know. But if they're going to survive another 15 to 20 years, it becomes a big burden on society. So we need to think about what we're going to be doing about that. So we've agreed that we have this notion of shared care that puts the patient at the centre, that puts you into one of those bubbles where a low risk patient walks into your service and you identify there's a problem and you move them on and when they become problematic they stay in hospital or in between hospital and you in a community glaucoma setup. And there are a lot of people now involved in this shared care, as I said. A lot of, it's now a multi-professional effort. And there's a lot of blurring of professional responsibilities, a lot of blurring of levels of expertise of people who take on this shared care.
and it seems now with all the numerous schemes we have, it's a bit of a free-for-all, basically. You know, we have all sorts of labels of shared care and non. And um, we need, to, it, it's a bit of a survival of the fetus, but anybody who was around during the 80s who would have delved into trying diabetic retinopathy screening, invested in the top con camera, only to have the rug pulled from underneath them when the National Screening Committee set up schemes that were sort of big hub and spoke settings. So there's that reluctance, there's that. And glaucoma is not quite as easy as diabetic retinopathy because it's not just a picture, it's pressure, fields, gonioscopy, and optic nerve head. Um, so people are asking themselves, do I want to get involved? Do I not want to get involved? Um, but we're also aware of our responsibilities with the recent NICE guidelines and nobody wants to fall foul of having not picked up a patient with glaucoma because again our community is getting more litigious unfortunately but it's true so we need to know what's right to do. So as I said there are very many schemes. I'm sure you recognize many of these different terminologies. Um, which is very different from diabetic retinopathy screening. There, there's case finding, referral refinement, repeat measure. Um, how many people take do repeat measures, just generally, even if you're not part of the scheme? Right, so a lot of, so you are deep, you're deeper into shared care than you realize. How many people get remunerated for repeat measures? Very few. It would be interesting to see what your views are on that. I really want to see. Um, and then there are all these monitoring. Olga, Olga is a Manchester scheme. Um, new case detection and all that. And then all these different schemes take place in all sorts of locations. And we already know what the diagnostic tests we need to do, or we think we know, but that again is changing. We all know that we need to take a good history to be able to pick out the risk factors. We need to do a little bit about the patient's medical condition. And it's not been discriminatory. Because if somebody has CA head of pancreas and all they want to do is leave the remaining three months in peace, why send them to, and their field is only just beginning to get lost what they can see and they're no longer driving, why send them to an eye department to spend four hours of the remaining three months of their life? Uh, it's important that we consider this and when you do that, just document it and be able to defend it. And if they get cured miraculously, you've documented it because it's important we treat the patient the way we would like to be treated. So just saying, oh, this patient has a pressure of 24, and I did the visual fields, and they've got minus 4 decibel loss, and the optic nerve looks glottochromatous, but the patient has said to you, I've got a life expect, I've been told I'll be gone in 3 to 6 months, or the relative has said that it would be wrong to send that patient to hospital. It would be totally wrong, and we need to be bold enough to take that stand. Whereas on the other hand, you see a 28-year-old African, West African origin young chap walking, beginning to look suspicious and precious of 27. Uh, not only will I send them to hospital, because you think, well, he's not 40 yet, but he's got potentially 60 years ahead of him. So I will be more forceful, no matter what the local piece of paper says, and saying you need to be seen. Now, with nice the new NDA to one, central corneal thickness no longer comes in, so you don't need to worry about CCT in the community, but you now don't need to refer if there's no other risk factor of optic nerve or field change, you can keep patients even on Goldman tonometry up to intraocular pressures of 24 millimeters of mercury in the practice without even referring them to the community and just check their pressures every year if there's no other risk factors. But when they get moved to the next stage, we then need to do disc imaging, 
visual fields as well as um, um, make a diagnosis. Now, what do you think that is? We don't have this here yet, but I saw that at an exhibition in, like an exhibition like this in, uh, when I went to a conference in the States. This is a little device which is in the shopping malls where you put your credit card in, you sit in one position, and it revolves. One, at one end, you've got your field machine, so you do your field. It revolves to the next, when you sit in the same position, it tells you to look at a flashing light, you do your OCT in the right and left eye. It revolves again, and then it does a, a 3D optic nerve head image, and it revolves it again, and then it does a non-contact intraocular pressure. And then you pay and you go, you put your details in, and it gets sent remotely to the nearest of the, the nearest ophthalmologist who signed up to be part of the this optometrist for that matter who signed up to be part of their and those people then do the review. So we're getting a bit close to diabetic retinopathy screening here. And after the review, the patient then gets information in the post either saying that you're free of glaucoma or you need to have another check in a year's time, or you need to come into the office, we need to recheck you on the slit lamp. But we don't have common standards for this thing. This is another device which was in a study done by a Greek, Greek group in which patients at home who use a virtual reality device to check their own fields. And the reason I'm looking at this with you is that we need to be aware of what changes are our food and we need to be asking ourselves, are we going to be part of this change? Because we already know a lot of people are getting their glasses on the internet, they're getting their contact lenses on the internet, and this is another part of, of, of eye care that's really But we can get involved if we're aware, because you can get involved as a screener, as a grader, or by doing the specialty training things. Um, if you choose to do glaucoma, or if it's macular, you choose to do anything else. Or if you choose not to do any of those things, you need to make a conscious decision about what you're going to do differently, because things are changing. And can you see, that's the virtual reality goggle field and the Humphreys goggle uh, on the Humphreys field. Very, very similar. So you can sit at home and do your own visual fields. You can choose to purchase those and hire them to patients to do their fields at home, or if they're patients who are homebound, if you're a domiciliary optometrist, you can bring those with you. Or if you've got children of patients who are elderly with glaucoma who come to your practice, that's a possibility of taking care of those patients without you having to get into the car to see the patient. Now, like I said, we also know that diabetic retinopathy has a su successful sort of model. Anyone who was around in the 80s would know that that was what we initially used to do for diabetic retinopathy screening. Just the optometrist, uh, just the ophthalmologist and the physicians with a, an ophthalmoscope who look at the patient on the ward and that was what we did. That meant 90% of the diabetics didn't get a look in. We had a lot of blindness from diabetes. Nobody wants that. And then in the early 90s we had this sort of mixture of what was to come and what we had which was when everybody went out and bought their cameras and we were all taking pictures and we all got involved and we all sort of made investments. Like I said, only for it all to be taken away by the screening. But that wasn't a bad thing because if I was a diabetic, I would rather have what's happening now, which is a very systematic, well thought through, ad administrative as well as digital imaging system where my image gets taken, I get early treatment or early warning, and I don't lose sight. The reason that's important is we're thinking, where is glaucoma going to go? Unfortunately, glaucoma
glaucoma does not meet the criteria for the national screening program. And the reason it doesn't meet the criteria, I'm sure you've worked out yourselves, is that it's not just a question of looking at a few red dots in the retina and a few squiggly vessels. Glaucoma has multiple and varied risk factors. We have people with normal pressure going blind and people with high pressure with perfect vision. And then there are many different reasons where your optic disc will be pale. And there are many different reasons, a brain tumor, why you will have visual field loss. So it's not so straightforward with glaucoma. And in the absence, we've already said that, and we have a lot of false positives and false negatives with visual field. So in order to be able to um, have a good screening scheme, we need tests with high sensitivity and specificity, which we unfortunately don't have with glaucoma, because as I've said, you will wrongly send people to the clinic who have high pressures and keep people who have normal pressures who then go blind with normal tension glaucoma. It's also impossible to tell which people will go blind, but our history of African myopic family history gives you a bit of an idea. And like I said, you know, it's very difficult to, to use a simple test. And that is why, because even I keep asking myself and I keep forgetting that why is there no national screening for glaucoma? Why isn't there an organized system for glaucoma like diabetes? That is why. Because to run a national screening program, you've got to have a simple test with high specificity and sensitivity, which we don't have in glaucoma. So we've got to do it the difficult way at the moment. I say at the moment because I think that will change. And I think that is going to change quicker than we expect it to. So for now, we're left with case finding. We're left with repeat measurements and enhanced case finding and, and, and virtual clinics and all that. Now, if I was a patient with glaucoma, or if I really cared about my patients, what do I want? What I want is to reduce blindness and sight loss from glaucoma. And I would like to have this done in a way in which none of my patients are excluded, or none of the potential people who will go blind are excluded, so I'd like it to be universal. I'd like it to be convenient, not a four-hour stay in my, one of my clinics uh, in the NHS. I'd like it to be affordable both to me as an individual and to the healthcare system. I'd like it to be effective. And it's very important that we always now need to consider that it needs to be future-proof. We don't want to invest in huge equipment only to find that obviously every equipment, just like our laptops, it's all right for us to expect a life time of five to eight years, but not if it's going to be one to two years. Because technology doesn't change that fast in one to two years, but politics does. And it's politics that suddenly decides we're not doing this community scheme anymore, we're doing something else. So, and in order to get it future-proof, we need to determine with our community, professional communities, what is the standard? And we need to say that this is going to be the standard for the next five years or eight years. And how do we set standards? We start with training. And that's why I was asking that who is interested in doing any of this training, or who's done it? If you are interested in glaucoma, it is worth considering, because I got all these different certificates from the um, higher qualification web page of the College of Optometrists where you do a little bit of training to, to stay in the community doing the referral requirement, the monitoring, the ocular hypertension in the community or you get more involved at the, at the hospital level where you're actually making independent decisions about patient care and patient management. And these standards have been agreed by various professional organizations, by the College of Optometrists, Ophthalmologists. NICE is helping us and 
and there's the collaborative called the SAFE. Now, one of the things we could do immediately is get comfortable with doing Goldman tonometry. Because following the NGA to one, the CCGs now have funding for Goldman tonometers. So you just need to find out from your local, maybe your LOC, what's happening about getting the funding and possibly getting the training to do Goldman tonometry. And also find out what the remuneration for that is. Another thing that NGH1 has done is introduce the use of um, prostaglandin analog, generic prostaglandin analogs as first line. Up till now I've had a significant issue with that. It's fine if the people have, do they have glaucoma, do they not, if they just fit a paper criteria. Um, but we need to be able to support our patients who are really losing vision from glaucoma in explaining to our GPs and our commissioners that a generic wouldn't do. Or people who are um, sensitive to preservatives and all that type of thing. So that's one thing in the NICE guideline because you will be faced with situations where patients say to you, I went to the hospital, the doctor wrote a preservative free monopost or teopex or a danport for me, but my GP keeps um, sending me back to a generic. And as a professional, you should be able to support your patients in saying to them, actually, I'll check your pressure now, and yes, your pressure is out of control, or your pressure is well in control, but you're not able to use your drops because your eyes are very bright red, and I'll write a letter to the GP saying, yeah, this patient's pressure is controlled on the generic, but their compliance is reduced because they've got red eyes. I'm not saying we do that for everybody, it's only a small percentage and as professionals we need to be able to say yes, I'm a member of the public, I'm a taxpayer, I'd like as many people as possible to be on generics because it comes from my funding, but as a clinician I'd like to make sure that those who need it also have preservative free non-generic drops. And so these are the expected benefits. They hope to reduce prescription costs, but they also hope that more patients will be treated in the appropriate setting, and that's where you're coming. And that's why you need to engage in, in, in the next stage of, of, of sort of journey up on your glaucoma or other care, MEP, MEC, whatever else you choose to do. But you need to make, the, we're at crossroads now, and I think, very soon it would no longer be good enough just to do things you've always done because change is afoot. And as I said, they're now in the process of designing the enhanced optometric services and part of that would be those type of, the, the, the sort of next level of glaucoma care in the community you may want to be involved in. And it's only by being engaged in that and by being investing in the qualification for that that you'll get appropriately remunerated and the patients will get appropriately treated. However, we still have the challenge of, of the, we don't have a kind of fail-safe they have with diabetic retinopathy screening. So we've, got a, we've talked about training, fail-safe we don't have, and in order to do that, that is a challenge that the glaucoma care community needs to work on. And then we need systems, because part of the problem we now have as clinicians, in the hospital anyway, is we don't have a good system of getting the information from you. I work at the Whittington Hospital. Most of the time I get the Chisholm book paper. You've probably done visual fields. It doesn't arrive to me. Even the hospital eye care service information you've got doesn't always arrive to me. So we need to work together on getting you getting information to me. And quite importantly, me providing feedback to you. Because unfortunately, we're in that sort of spaghetti junction, I'll call it, in, in, in glaucoma care, where 
We're no longer on that spot where it's just a red dot and a few people with glaucoma are being picked up, but we don't have a good system like the DRS for communication at the moment. And I'll just say to you that I would like to assure you that many ophthalmologists are, are frustrated about, about the fact that we cannot communicate to you what we find in the patients. Because what we now have is within the same hospital that has three or four um, CCGs around, you could have three or four different schemes going on. Like there's that scheme that I picked up from Nottingham that they started about 2013. And even in one in that hospital alone, they have four different schemes depending on, on the surrounding CCGs around them. And then there's this other scheme in Manchester, which is the um, glaucoma enhanced referral service. They're slightly more organized, but that's a new scheme. Um, and we're Currently with glaucoma care in this sort of clear as mud middle way. But no one's going to go away and give us the nice green organized side. We need to do that ourselves. And then on top of that we have the modern challenges of, of urban living. Because you've probably found out yourself that patients are no longer um, as it were um, loyal, you know? They will come to one optometrist today, they will go to another optometrist tomorrow. Whereas before, or those few, the few ones that are loyal, you can tell your, the father had glaucoma, I'm going to check for glaucoma in, in the young person. But when patients chop and change as they do at the moment, you don't have that background history that will make it very easy for you to have a quick look and move them on. So we need to think about that. And patients want to take their prescription and go and buy their contact lens and their glasses over the, uh, online. And we need to think creatively about creating loyalty in our community by helping them, by putting leaflets in the practice that says to them, by sticking with one optometrist, these are the long-term benefits for you and for your family. And even if you move three or four miles down the road, I would strongly suggest that you keep with the same optometrist because the relationship you build is not just about selling glasses when you're 20, 30, but when you're 40, 50, 60, the images we capture of, of your eyes now will help us to see if there's progressive change over time. So building that relationship based on refocusing our patients to be loyal because it is beneficial to them in the long term is quite important. Um, and for us in the hospital, we need to find, to get over what our managers are getting us to do because right now for me, in my NHS practice, I dictate a letter, it goes off to India to get typed. Different from the old days where the secretary has the notes and I say to the secretary, copy to the GP. There are many challenges now, a copy to the optometrist. There are many challenges now with copying to the optometrist because your hospitalized service form is not in the patient's notes. What I get is the chosen book from the GP. And when I say copy to the optometrist, the person in India doesn't see the notes at all because they're not even allowed to have the patient's name for patient confidentiality reasons. The type the the type what I've dictated and what I've dictated then gets matched to a, a unique number. So that's why you're not getting feedback. But that hopefully will change. Another thing that's absent, like because we don't have a screening scheme, we don't have a way of capturing those people who wouldn't come to optometrists because they're scared of being told they need 400 pounds to buy glasses. So they will buy their, they'll go to Tiger Tiger and buy their three pound pair of glasses and they never get their pressures checked, unfortunately. And on top of that, even if they wanted to, in the socioeconomically deprived areas, there aren't many optometry shops. But some at risk people are at least are fine, they're getting, if they're in domiciliary care, they do get the domiciliary optometrist, but there are a lot of people hidden. Those people who are at home on their own, who have in-house carers, who don't have a system to take care of their needs. 
there at home and it's, it's useful to actually check with uh, younger patients if, if they sort of mention to us they've got old people at home. So I think you will agree with me that and if any of you are influencers in your different optometry professional groups, that it's about time that we work on getting what would be a minimum data set for our glaucoma patients, that we need to work on workflow and pathways that get information from you to us and from us back to you, that we have standards for clinic setup, we have digital standards for information transfer, and that we have a standard admin system so that we have a good call recall system for our patients. We should get ambitious about new case finding. Just like the diabetic retinopathy scheme, scheme did, we could say to our CCGs and to our politicians, we could go and say to our MPs in our MP clinic in their surgery, we could go and challenge them and say to them, and you can get very emotional about it. I just saw a 65-year-old fit person go blind from glaucoma because we don't have a screening scheme. We need to challenge our CCGs to set targets for picking up 75% or 85% of all glaucomas, and we need to set a scheme to do that. And then we need to get involved in targeted public health campaigns to at risk populations, um, especially in the deprived communities. And we need to remember to invite relatives of any patient we have with ocular hypertension or glaucoma. Anybody who in our practice has ocular hypertension or glaucoma, who has relative, first degree relatives over the age of 40, are allowed to come and have, I'm sure you know that, a free glaucoma chair. But we're all too busy to do these things, and if you just create a little leaflet and just give it to the patient, hopefully they will bring their relatives to see you and we'll be able to pick them up early. And finally, we need to think about the infrastructure. Um, we need to transition to digital. Now, this is, we can't, we can't get away from that. And by transitioning to digital, if we have digital visual fields machines, so if you're buying your next visual fields machine, make sure it has digital capability. Because sooner or later, if there's ever going to be remuneration, if you can prove that you've done visual fields and transfer it digitally, it can get tagged that it's been done. Because in hospital care, I think we now have a time limit to convert in all our systems, like at the Royal Free, I think in the next three years, everything's going to be digital. So it's going to be more traceable, and there's going to be a lot more cutting out of the middleman, cutting out of the GP, and direct referral to hospital, or direct referral to choose and book, and then choose and book will refer on to either the community or the hospital. But what's good about that is that there will now be a way of capturing people who have done the required NICE guideline investigations, whether that's standard tonometer, standard implantation, or standard um, perimetry, or whatever it is. And we need to challenge our, all the people with the equipment that is your equipment DICOM compatible because if it's not DICOM compatible, that it's able to speak with other equipment. You won't be able to digitally transfer the information you capture to hospital or to the community or to choose and book. We also need to think about national information sharing. I mean, it's been more than 20 years now since we talked about this electronic patient record and the national spine and all that type of thing. I think it's important as clinicians to say to your patient, do you agree that your doctor shares the outcome of your hospital visit with me? Because I, I ask patients that as well. That sort of reminds them, and even if, even if the doctor isn't sending it directly to you, almost every patient now gets a copy of their letter. So you can say to them, if you agree, currently we don't have a system of getting the letters directly from the hospital, but could you do me a favor, the next time you come, could you please bring a copy of your hospital letter with you? 
and I just have a photocopier in your office or have a scanner in the office and I will give it straight back to you because I'm just going to scan it and give it straight back to you. Why is that important? We learn. You know, if you send something to the hospital, feedback, you get feedback and there is no feedback better than hands-on feedback. That is your wet lab. You know, you've seen that patient and somebody else has reviewed the patient and you get the feedback and you get better for the next time. And you get better, you get safer, you get more competent and you get more, you get better engaged with your patient care. And we don't have compliance targets, but that is coming. We need to set standards for OCD. I was here at the end of a talk before me. And something that's missing from this, I'm thinking, I thought this is about change and change is constant. He showed an image of a digital gonioscopy, gonioscope. So where all you need to do, and you're better at putting contact lenses on than I am, is a 16 mirror gonio, Snydeck, I think, gonio DS1 or something. And this is where you can then completely do the whole glaucoma care in your practice. So you're actually ready to do the second, the next stage of whatever your community called it, because you've got field sorted, you've got OCT sorted, you've got gold management, deplanation, tonometry sorted, gonioscopy, which tends to be what people don't like doing. You may not even have to learn to do it because all you need to do is put a contact lens on and I think, I believe that I have nothing to do with, I think it was permanent optical. You put the contact lens on and it takes from the 16 mirror gonio image, it's not an OCT, it takes a real color photo of the angle, right? And then it either shows it to you in a donut or it shows it to you opened out, you know the way we get the optic nerve in the head OCT opened out. And the next stage obviously to that is artificial intelligence. It didn't do one thing, it doesn't show a slip beam because you need the, the, you need the wedge to be sure where your, where your Schwalbe's line is. But I asked that question and he says that's the next stage. So you see it's all there, it's all out there, you're ready to take it on. And with a good patient administration system, we'll be able to record our low risk glaucoma patients that you'll be taking care of the middle risk glaucoma patients who will go into community and the high risk glaucoma patient who will be coming to me. And of course economies of scale because if we don't think of it that way and this is where you may need to consider cooperatives because that equipment, those equipments cost money and we all know that to see one glaucoma patient takes so much time but if you had a set aside glaucoma service in your community or in your Lotsu or whatever it is, you can send many patients there and maybe spend half a day a week. Everybody spends half a day a week doing the glaucoma service and because you've got many numbers coming through, you get the professional satisfaction, the equipment pays for themselves, you're much more invested in pushing many more patients through to go and get properly investigated. And then we will improve the detection of glaucoma from 50% to 75%, to 80% to 90%. And you can run this out of our service in the evenings and at weekends for people who are very busy. So in summary, there is no national screening program for glaucoma and there ain't gonna be one. But because we all agree that glaucoma is the silent thief of sight, we've seen the posters everywhere, we need to do something for our glaucoma patient. We need to start with public and patient engagement, so have some glaucoma leaflets. We've put some leaflets from my eye clinic in the bag. You can just copy, up, copy those and leave them out if you don't want to go through typing them yourself. Um, you can just copy it and leave it out for your patients. Um, at the moment, as far as glaucoma, having organized screening, we're in that in-between phase, we're in that sort of tall, langy, legged, teenage phase where everything is clear as mud. We don't have digital standards, we don't have information sharing, we don't have a glaucoma register, but we can demand it. We can push for it in our little groups, we can speak to our MPs, and we can push for it in the larger forums that you may belong to.
we should push for remuneration. This is one thing, at least it's not about selling glasses, it's not about, it's not competition this time. And this is one thing that people don't talk about in this part of the world. You know, it's the elephant in the room. My, give me, my, give, I'm prepared to give you the gold tab, but I want to be paid for it. There's nothing wrong in asking to be paid for your service. Um, and because by the patients paying or the CCG paying a fair uh, remuneration for your service, you don't have to supplement the glaucoma patient who potentially go, who go blind with selling glasses to them. You can just do it as a professional and be very happy about it. Um, so we now hopefully, there is, while I was just doing this, I just came across this system assurance framework for high eye health. Has anybody heard about it? No. And it seems to be a fantastic idea because it's basically demanding what the diabetic ice cream program has done, but it's all hidden. So we need to get ourselves, because this is actually something that the CCG, all, your, all the College of Optometrists, ABDO, all the professional bodies are involved in. But I don't know why then the College of Ophthalmologists is involved in it. This is why sometimes it's when you do lectures that you learn. I only got to know about this yesterday. And ultimately what we would like is for our patients to be managed in the most appropriate service according to the severity of their disease and the skills of the practice. Um, and what's the key to our success? Ultimately, the key to our success is digital transformation. We cannot get away from that, and we should all embrace that. And I will say to you, if you're buying another piece of equipment, consider is it digital? Would it integrate? So get up, and we need to speak a common language. And yes, we can. We can hit 75%, 85% diagnosis of glaucoma if we just push our boat out a little bit and hopefully majority of our patients with glaucoma will no longer present to the eye clinic with minus 10 minus 28 decibel loss because it's a public service thing if we pick up two or three glaucoma patients they go out and tell other people in their coffee mornings they tell their families, even if they're just glaucoma suspects, and you say to them, if you're black, you're myopic, you're, you've got, can you tell your family to get checked? And say to them, even if they're in Nigeria or if they're in Croydon and they can't come to me, tell them to go and, and the person in Croydon tells them to come to Barnet and the person in Barnet tells them to send their relatives to Gloucester. Just get all, just tell the patients, not focusing on what comes to you, but what goes everywhere, that go get checked for glaucoma. Now, whatever we do needs to be future-proof. And that's the big thing. No matter how much we do today ourselves, a lot of what we're, in the next 10 years, a lot of our work will depend on decision support and artificial intelligence. And it's therefore very important that not only do we purchase digital equipment, but we have conversations with the manufacturers. Has any thought been put into how this is going to be, how, has there been machine learning? Is there any ongoing work on machine learning for this piece of equipment? Because I think eventually it will be the human interaction that we're going to be delivering as, as clinicians. We're going to be using very junior people in our practices to do the physical test. Artificial intelligence or diagnostic decision support is going to be spitting out the results. And then we're going to be having that conversation which no robot is going to be having just yet. So, would anybody consider learning a little bit more about higher qualification in glaucoma as well as artificial intelligence. Have I changed any minds? Thank you very much. Now I'm here to take questions. And I will send, if you want, please take my email address. If you want the whole talk, I will send it to you.